I thank you all for being here this evening. Uh, this is tough. It's a Friday night. Uh, we could be doing a lot of other uh, more interesting and perhaps fun things, but uh, hopefully we'll get into some interesting discussions about a very interesting, uh, fascinating country. Um, I'm going to uh, jump right in because I know we have uh, time in terms of challenge. It's a big city. It looks like about any city in the world. Um, and of course, uh, there's a lot more to South Africa than Johannesburg. But there's also a message here. Uh, this is also an image of Johannesburg. It's probably not one that some of you uh, might have thought about, and that, yes, that is snow. Uh, and that was uh, only last year. And we're going to come back to this in a prompt. And my prompt will be, if we can talk about it, remember, in South Africa, not everything is what it seems. So South Africa is not tropical, and it's not typical of Africa or indeed any other part of the world. So the question is, uh, how do we think about South Africa, and to what extent do we think about it in a way different from other countries? So I'm going to start in 1985, which was the beginning of the last half decade before apartheid really ended. It, it, it legally ended in 1994, but politically ended in 1990. And we have a profile of a country which is very interesting and very diverse. There were at that time almost a million people originally from India, roughly 2.7% of the country. There were roughly between 24 and 28 million uh, South Africans reflecting at the time approximately 72% of the country. Of these, about 30,000 are internationally classified as indigenous. That is, they are uh, of the original peoples that were in South Africa over uh, 200, uh, over 2,000 years ago. <coughs> Others include Chinese, Japanese, and Arabic. <coughs> we're not done yet. There were approximately, at that time, 15% uh, of the population classified by the South African government as white. 60% were Afrikaans speakers, that is, they spoke a form of Dutch. 40% were English speakers. Of these, mainly English speakers, there were about 100,000 people who uh, had a Jewish religious background or a secular Jewish identification. There were approximately 4 million, slightly less than 4 million, so-called colored. This is a designation that's not terribly accurate. Some people refer to it as mixed race. Of these, about 80% were and are Afrikaans speaking, and 20% roughly were and are English speaking. Now, that's a very diverse, very large spread of people. One of uh, my former colleagues and friends described this as a world within a country because it reflects not all of the dynamics of a very diverse world, but certainly many of them. <coughs> Part of the story of South Africa is trying to understand how all of these people got there, when they got there, and since everything in South Africa has been political for many, many years, what the politics of demographics actually mean. <coughs> so we're going to look at several themes over the course of the next uh, roughly two to two and a half hours. We're going to start with the demographic debates of origins and the whole debate about Indian indigenuity or indigenous origin the debate about settlers or citizens, discussion of imperialism. Uh, I've subtitled this from assimilation to segregation. We're going to talk then about so-called Afrikaner nationalism and apartheid and nationalism and liberation. And we're going to divide this about equally between the period before the end of apartheid in 1990 to 1994, and the, some roughly now uh, 12, 14 years after the end of apartheid, 
looking at post departure. But okay, this is a list, and I'm not going to go through these in great detail, except that you see the origins of South Africa go back to roughly uh, 1600 BC, running up to roughly 200 uh, BC. What we've got here are a list of dates that give you an image of how people came into southern Africa and into more generally eastern Africa over a 3,000 year period. If you'll notice, the last to arrive, 1652, are the so-called Afrikaner group, and then later in 1820, uh, the British group, people who left uh, England uh, and English colony and English uh, uh, speaking countries to come to South Africa. The Portuguese by uh, turn came as early as 1600, but by then people were, had long started living in Southern and in South Africa uh, as long ago as at least 1500 uh, to 1800 when we had arrivals coming into this part of the world uh, from essentially from Central and West Africa. We have a, a, a way to understand that this was occurring. If you can see these, or you'll look later on, you'll see there are little numbers on this map. These represent Iron Age sites in Eastern and Southern Africa. And so, for example, in what is now South Africa, we have three, three sites that are noted, 100 AD, 300 AD, and 400 AD. That, that means that we know that there were people in this part of the world working with and using iron as early as just at the end of the uh, so-called so uh, new millennium, the, 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 the 2,000 years since we begin modern dating. So, map here to give you a sense of the way we think movement occurred. And again, we're talking about roughly uh, between 500 BC, between 1000 BC and 500 AD, the movement from in West Africa, what is sometimes called the so-called Bantu home area, by, by uh, uh, this occurred through gradual movements of people as people migrated, took up technical uh, skills, and then began to move into uh, Eastern first and then Southern Africa uh, to exist as essentially uh, settled farmers growing crops uh, using iron weapons and keeping animals. This is an image of the first people. This is obviously <coughs> not a historical image, probably set in either uh, Botswana or in Namibia, but the sun rule and presence in Southern Africa that probably goes back much longer than uh, 200 AD is part of the so-called indigenous debate. There's little question that the San people who spoke a click language, if any of you know the region, you'll know that click has crept into Posa, which I don't say correctly, uh, one of the major languages, but the San were essentially hunter-gatherers. And as traditional life, they are still hunter-gatherers, although many now no longer hunter-gather. Uh, some of them work on ranches, others work in other kinds of uh, professions. Some go to school. There is, of course, a debate about the indigenous people, particularly in Namibia and Botswana, where there are questions about whether or not they're being appropriately treated. That's a side story, one we could talk about. But instead, we go back and we talk a little bit about the myth as it affects politics. The debate from the arrival of Jan van Riebeck, that is the first Dutch settler to come to South Africa, was about who, in fact, came first. Jan van Riebeck and his settler colleagues in the 17th and 18th century, and even into the 19th, early 20th century claim they got there first because they migrated by a sea whereas the Bantu speakers were uh, arriving by a land. The, what the, the argument was well, who entered the bounds of what was the modern quote unquote South Africa. When I'm going back to our earlier slide it's very clear that 
the, the indigenous South Africans arrived some probably uh, 500 to 1,000 years <coughs> before the Dutch arrived. And even before that, of course, there were San or Khoisan uh, peoples living there. So the myth that was created and to some extent was perpetuated by apartheid was A, the Europeans came first, wrong. B, uh, the Bantu-speaking peoples were not indigenous to uh, South Africa, to what is now uh, the Republic of South Africa. Also wrong. But these myths create political uh, images, and they are important for us to understand the claim. Late arrival, the British first landing at Table Bay on uh, 17th of March, 1820. The British had taken over South Africa from the Dutch as part of the spoils of the Napoleonic War, if you can study any European uh, history. And they arrived and came into what is uh, now the eastern uh, uh, part of the Cape, uh, near uh, either uh, probably Port Elizabeth, in, somewhere in that area, or East London, what's now called East London. So let's look at some dates. <coughs> the timeline runs from essentially uh, in its first phase through from 8, 1652 to 1960. Jan von Riebeck arrives in 1652. The British take over the Cape Colony, which is not the whole of South Africa, but part of it. The rest remaining in Dutch hands in 1815. In roughly 1890, Cecil John Rhodes creates what is called the British South Africa Company, takes over control of, as Prime Minister, the Cape Colony, takes over Bechuanaland, which is now the country of Botswana, and creates and administers uh, the Rhodesias and takes control of Nyasaland, that is, what is now Zambia, Zimbabwe, and Malawi. Something called the Union of South Africa is declared in 1910. The Union of South Africa was a racially, legally segregated state in which only white South Africans, roughly 15% of the population, maybe a little bit more in those days, was enjoyed full rights of citizenship. Others from India, indigenous peoples, so-called Bantu-speaking people, uh, mixed-race people, all had only partial, if any, legal rights in their own country. The characteristics of South Africa in 1910 were probably not all that different legally and socially from the situation in the United States, particularly, but not exclusively in the South around the same period. Not all that much different from indigenous peoples in Australia and in New Zealand. And indeed, the status that indigenous uh, Native uh, Americans enjoyed in North America, Canada, and the US, Central and South America. They were indeed, if you could call it that, second or third class citizens. However, it did get worse before it got better. In 1948, the political party, a white political party, uh, won an all-white election. Uh, the national party was the party of apartheid. Apartheid is a, an Afrikaans word which means apartness or separateness. Under apartheid, which became law after the national party victory, in 1948, all non-white peoples were legally separated from citizenship. They essentially carried a separate legal, as well as a social, economic, and political status. Okay. 1960 is another date. It's less significant for South Africans who are not white but it's an important date politically because in 1960 the National Party, uh, the National Party uh, declared itself a republic 
and formally withdrew from the British Empire and then common law. 1916 is an important date constitutionally uh, and essentially creates legally many of the modern structures that continue to exist. Single image, which is important to understand in South Africa and in Africa as a whole, was that there was this imperial period in which Europe, the French, the Belgians, uh, the uh, Germans originally, but most importantly the British had what is called the imperial dream. This is a cartoon from the time because not all British uh, cartoonists and journalists accepted the premise. What it shows is Cecil Rhodes, the creator of the Rhodes Scholar, uh, with, a, with the idea that he is going to create an empire from Cape Town where his one foot is, very significant uh, cartoon. And then the other foot, of course, is way up in Egypt. And of course, the assumption is that, that the British Empire is going to control everything in between. <coughs> We're talking about roughly 100 years from the 1890s for South Africa to 1994, when the final vestiges of the political segregation and imperial structures ended with the creation of a non-racial state in South Africa. Pseudo-scientific racism is a part of the story. This was an image from the 19th century. I don't know that it's unique to South Africa, but it clearly, it's an ugly image and it suggests different biological reasons why individuals are different from one another. It essentially, pseudo-scientific racism provided for whites a justification for the way in which they define their world and the way in which they define their relationships with the rest of the world. It's an ugly image, but it's one that's important to understand because that image had a strong impact on South Africa. There are probably still many South Africans of white origin who believe this. So this is not something that is uh, unique and special to South Africa. In many ways, South Africa <coughs> was following the prevailing values and images of the time. Uh, we're talking about roughly the 1870s, 1880s, and 1890s when this was a predominant and of course in this country, as in South Africa, it remained. This is another symbol which is important for us to understand as we think about South Africa. It's a British flag, except in, this, in the center there's a lion, and then BSAC, the British South Africa Company. Because the expansion of Europe into Africa and other parts of the world was also focused on commercial, economic, uh, and industrial opportunities. And in South Africa, a major part of the expansion in the 20th century has been the access to minerals, to gold, to diamonds, to uranium, and to other strategic minerals. Uh, that has remained an important factor. South Africa remains a major producer of gold, of course, significant in uh, international trade and in banking. The British South Africa Company, the creation of Cecil Rhodes, is another anchor to understanding economic and social and political policy. A third thing to understand is to understand the people and the way in which people live. We have an image of whites in South Africa, which is of people of privilege, which is of people uh, enjoying the highest standard of living in the world, and many of them do. This is a, 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 an image from 1900 that shows us the other part of the settler pattern in South Africa, that as in many countries, many different groups of people existed. 
This <coughs> is entitled A Boer Family from 1900. These are people who spoke Afrikaans or Dutch or a form of Dutch. Uh, Boer is the Dutch word for farmer. This is not a group of people that had a lot of wealth and indeed many Afrikaners throughout the 20th century in fact enjoyed a very different lifestyle, if I can use that word, from the rich and the wealthy and the urban dwellers who benefited from apartheid. Part of the competition among different groups and different types of people, in fact, uh, relate to the economic differences which have existed and continue to exist between groups and within <coughs> groups. And clearly, this rural uh, settlement, uh, mud walls, and uh, very simple housing reflects a reality that we need to remember as we think about the evolution of South Africa. And this is another image. This is a, uh, an Af African family, or at least a clan. It's an image taken about the same time. Probably a stylized image, whether or not people were all carrying around uh, uh, spears, and, uh, uh, and, and costume is another question, but certainly this was an image that was projected both uh, inside and around the world, the Zulu being, of course, a major group in South Africa and a group which uh, projected an image from a military and uh, from, a, from a history of dominance in the 19th century. The, the Zulu as a people, as an empire, existed roughly running through to about the middle of the 19th century from, uh, for our, our, uh, at least 150 years. Powerful, in major competition with the Europeans, and indeed until they finally lost a war uh, in the 19th century, a dominant political force. Images, pictures are important. This is why we put them in here. Uh, and it's important to keep in mind the images as they modernize. Now, this is not something you will see anymore in South Africa. But this was colonialism in South Africa, a sub-colonial system, that is where local power from Britain was given to the white population. And of course, uh, it was mixed with commercial activities and interests. You can see the sign is in, it's probably from the 1940s, maybe even later. It's in both English and Afrikaans, and I'll read it just to give you, so those of you who can't uh, see it from the back uh, get a sense, for use by white persons. These public premises and the amenities of these thereof have been reserved for the exclusive use of white persons by order, provincial secretary, minister, uh, uh, senior administrator. Now, these are the equivalent of signs that we had in this country, in the South, until not very long ago. Uh, it, it, it says essentially the same thing in Afrikaans, the other European language. And these signs were present in South Africa as late as about 1983, 1984. I first went to South Africa in 1975. I saw them all over the place. The last vestiges in terms of the desegregation of buses in Johannesburg and particularly in Victoria <coughs> that I saw didn't probably occur until 1990 after Nelson Mandela was released from prison. This is a pattern of uh, de jure or legal segregation that continued to exist in South Africa right down through literally the end of the apartheid. This is another image which is important. This is an image from 1914. Unlike uh, other images, there's a relevance of this today. <coughs> this group, uh, these were four leaders uh, that created what they called the South African Native National Congress. South African Native National Congress later became the African National Congress. The African National Congress was the group that led the struggle against apartheid for many, many years. 
and of course under Nelson Mandela came to power in 1994 when he assumed the presidency. The South African national, uh, uh, the Na African National Congress remains in power today in uh, 2013. The term native was the term of European choice to describe uh, Africans until the 1940s when they decided the idea of native was not a good term because it suggested people belong there. They then dropped the term native as a descriptor and then used the term Bantu with the image and the assumption, well, Bantu people came from something somewhere else. You remember our map <coughs> showed them moving in uh, from West Africa. Labels, images, these are important ways of trying to understand South Africa as you do some of your reading uh, at a later point. Here's another important image, and it's one that relates to two things, nonviolence and Mahatma Gandhi. You probably know of Mahatma Gandhi as the uh, leader of India for many years, struggling against British imperialism. Gandhi started his rule, his uh, role in liberation in South Africa. He was a leader of the Indian community in South Africa. M.K. Gandhi, attorney, it says on the window. He's sitting there with a couple of his uh, colleagues and uh, I think part of his family. Gandhi brought a <coughs> view of nonviolence which remained important long after he returned to India in 1918. Nonviolence became part of the Congress movement. He created the so-called Indian Congress of South Africa. It became important for the African National Congress as well. Debates about violence versus <coughs> nonviolence would come up at a later point in the struggle against apartheid, particularly after 1960. Gandhi also symbolizes the close to one million Indians from India who settled mainly in Natal, but also in the Johannesburg area in a period roughly from 1870 through to 1900. Uh, many still there, many still uh, representing that community, almost all of them now South African citizenship. Okay. We're now moving forward, very rapid history here, but we only have a whole weekend, so we've got to get to the present very quickly. So I want to talk a little bit about the period from roughly the time that Gandhi left South Africa and went back to lead India to its independence to roughly World War II. This is a period when South Africa was called internationally a white dominion the term dominion that was given to South Africa by the British. They, they essentially had four quote unquote white dominions. Remember our mix makes us a little bit questionable as a label. The other three of course were Canada, the dominion of Canada, New Zealand, and Australia. All three of course had a much more diverse population than just whites, but again, that was the prevalent <coughs> image that was projected by Britain and indeed by the world during this period. Now, there are four major characteristics which I think are important when we think about 1918 <coughs> to 1939, the span between uh, the two wars. First, this is when investment and mining developed. Major economic activity that made South Africa a major economic power and a source for important minerals, raw materials, uh, and uh, secondarily uh, important agricultural products. Second characteristic, this period, 1919, 1939, roughly a 20-year period. This period reflected what I call a worldwide similarity of values. 
during this period, South Africans, with their laws, with their social behavior, with their political restrictiveness, were not different from the rest of the world. They reflected the similarity of values. We admit it, we have to admit it in this country, and this was not very different in the rest of the world. The world before World War II was a world that was defined by racial classification and by the assumption that your people of European origin had, were better, had a different status, had different privileges in the world. Thirdly, this period was defined by the fact that this country was part of a British Empire. A British Empire in which a small European island, Britain, ruled 25% of the people of the world. 25%, a lot of people. They created or evolved out of the British Empire many, many different countries. Um, some of you have studied them. Uh, they include, of course, India, which is one of the other BRIC countries. Uh, they, they include, of course, uh, uh, countries in every continent uh, of the world, except for Antarctica, which doesn't have any people. Fourth thing which is important, coming out of the pre-World War II international system, South Africa was a country that was internationally recognized as independent, as legal, and as legitimate. So in fact, in 1994, when we had the end of apartheid, not much legally happened. A new constitution was written, the legal system was restructured to become non-racial, but South Africa remained what it was, the Republic of South Africa. It did not become Azania. It did not become an independent state, though some South Africans talk about independence. It essentially became a non-racial state, which is uh, of some significance in terms of the history of this part of the world. A fifth image is an image of us trying to understand the complexity of politics in South Africa. Some people are puzzled and remain puzzled about the relationship between the South African Communist Party and the African National Congress. Indeed, the role of the SACP, as it's sometimes called, is a complicated one. It had its origins in working class Europeans who came to South Africa roughly after 1900 through the 1920s and was established in the mining industry. 1922, white South Africans went on strike. They went on strike because the mine workers were introducing quote unquote Bantu workers into the mines. What was their slogan? Workers of the world unite. Typical of the Marxist party. And fight for a white South Africa. South African Communist Party has always tried to balance, or had to balance, class views with its, uh, with its ethnic origins, never quite succeeding in balancing either of these. That being said, South African Communist Party, through the trade unions, through its alliance with the African National Congress, remains an important political player, one which essentially has like communist parties in other parts of the world, really become very comfortable with the framework of uh, what we will call a largely capitalist economy. But the origins of the South African Communist Party, though it later would appeal to people of African, Indian, mixed race background, was in fact, at least initially, part of the white working class that worked in the mind. <coughs> 1922, another thing happened. The Carnegie Commission of New York, that's our Carnegie, by the way, Andrew. Uh, Carnegie Mellon University, heard of that place? That was the, uh, <laughs> you know, 
some of you don't, but others do. Carnegie Commission put up a major investigation into South Africa in 1932. What were they concerned about? They were concerned about poverty. What were they concerned about, really? They were concerned about white poverty, because many, many, particularly Afrikaner, or Dutch speakers, but also some British speakers, had become very poor as a result of the International Depression. The Carnegie Commission still looks back at this as not one of their proudest moments, because the Carnegie Commission essentially, operating out of New York, with money from Andrew Carnegie, sent, essentially went in and ignored four fifths of the population. What they did do for us, however, is give us a good picture of the racial divisions and of the economic uh, problems of the country during this period of time. They identified in particular the problem of what the Carnegie Commission <coughs> called poor whites. Not surprisingly, uh, people continue to remind the Carnegie Commission of this finding uh, that in many ways defined the politics. Politics in South Africa among whites is almost always focused on concern about poverty, real poverty by the way, among poor whites in South Africa because poor whites in 1932 had the right to vote. Why weren't they so concerned about poverty among the other four-fifths of the population? Because they did not have the right to vote. And if any of you would question whether or not elections are important, they are certainly important, at least in the way in which they impact on the thinking of populations. If people can't vote, they're not going to affect public policy. So the poor white problem became identified by our New York-based Carnegie Commission in 1932. By the mid-1940s, South Africa had developed a significant urban population. Despite the protests of the white workers, white workers of the world unite, despite the findings of the Carnegie, Carnegie Commission that focused on white uh, South Africa, <coughs> nonetheless, Millions and millions of Africans, black South Africans, were in fact moving into the cities, moving into Johannesburg, <coughs> moving into Durban, moving into Port Elizabeth, moving into all of the major cities in South Africa, but in particular Johannesburg because that's where the mines were, that's where the minerals were, that's where the monies were. This image shows us probably around 1940, 1948, the Town in Johannesburg, in the Transvaal, which was one of the major settlements of Africans in the city of Johannesburg until they were expelled by the Afrikaners uh, in the 1950s. By 1959, roughly a million people had been moved, well, maybe 800,000 people had been moved out. So Town had been uh, renamed Prium, Prium and some with working class white South Africans uh, and housing was provided for them. After 1994, <coughs> the new government renamed Sophia Town, uh, renamed Cram Sophia Town, but it still remains largely a working class white settlement. The richness, the vibrance, what is called the Johannesburg music sound, all came out of Sophia Town. Where were these people moved? For the most part, they were moved to uh, Soweto and to the other major urban township, which were essentially commuter satellite towns outside of Johannesburg <coughs> itself. Urban South Africa, despite the uh, abolition of residence, of black residency in Sophia Town, however, was there to stay by 1948. Jumping back just a few years to the middle of World War Two, uh, a new development occurred politically. It's important to keep the balance of perspective here in terms of what was happening at the top, in terms of apartheid and apartheid values, and what was happening at the base and within the leadership of the African National Congress. 
By 1943, the African National Congress had become kind of an old organization. It was made up of professionals. It was made up of some lawyers, some teachers, some pastors, some traditional leaders. Uh, it, it was a, perhaps an upper middle to middle class interest group more than anything else. For indeed, there were some people, not many, but some, who reflected middle class and religious values. Four people came to power in the African National Congress Youth League. One man named Peter Nda, who was said to be the most dynamic of the bunch. Unfortunately, Nda died of cancer in 1948 and didn't stay on too long. Three others who were pictured in their older years, I couldn't find the younger picture, were Nelson Mandela, his deputy, Walter Sisulu, who of course, as you know, spent many years on Robben Island and then uh, both were released and Mandela became president, and Oliver Tambo, who for 40 years led the African National Congress, uh, both in South Africa and then later for 30 years overseas. The African National Congress Youth League adapted the ANC to make it a more mass-based organization, <coughs> focusing on the transition to a non-racial state, the creation of a popular base, and a commitment to African affirmative action to try to actively promote the status of the majority of South Africans economically, <coughs> socially, but of course, most importantly, politically. So, uh, we're talking here now about a transition of magnitude <coughs> politically, and we're talking about a period from roughly 1943 to 1942, uh, to, to 1943 to 1994, uh, in which a transition of tremendous magnitude occurs within South Africa. I mean, we're going to talk a little bit more now about some of the, uh, of the diversity of people. Religion is an important factor in South Africa. It was an important part of the apartheid movement. The Dutch Reformed Church, in fact, uh, is sometimes called the National Party at Prayer. Uh, it essentially religiously justified apartheid until uh, the roughly in 1985, when they decided they couldn't do that anymore, and then they said no, and they were wrong. All of the Christian religions are represented through missionaries. Of course, there are significant numbers of Muslims, especially in the Cape, uh, in the Cape Town area, and of course, an important group of indigenous religions, which continues to be represented uh, in the majority population around the country. But there's an important group which you which is worth following because this is an important group in small town in rural South Africa. And this is what are sometimes called the syncretistic religions. They're a combination of Christianity and the indigenous religion, originally influenced by uh, missionaries, but now on their own and not affiliated with any international Christianity. <coughs> the largest of these the Zion Christian Church uh, originated in the 19th century and remained a huge social influence in especially small town and rural South Africa. For many years, the Zion Christian Church, a conservative church, essentially went along with the idea of apartheid. Still, I don't think is quite comfortable with the nationalism of the African National Congress, but remains, particularly in the northern central parts of South Africa is an important factor. Two images uh, here, the image, uh, two images on the bottom from Zion City uh, in what is now uh, the Popo or the Northern Province, and of course the other image from the Zulu area of the Christian missionary sitting in the chair, of course I think probably teaching women, shall we say, how to sew or something like that, and of course there weren't enough chairs to go around, so uh, they're comfortable. The, the, the importance of religion, missionaries, indigenous, and syncretistic is an important part of the social fabric of what is South Africa today. 
So we're in now at the end of World War II. And it's important, again, for us to think about what South Africa meant at this time. This is Winston Churchill. And uh, a guy named Peter <coughs> Fraser, who I think was Australian, but I'm not entirely sure. And the guy in the uniform was the Prime Minister of South Africa, Jan Christian Smuts, the last Prime Minister prior to the coming to power of the National Party. But this reflects the closeness of Britain and South Africa and South Africa and the other, remember what we call them, white dominions coming out of World War II. Smuts was a member of the War Cabinet. South Africa fought in World War II significantly in all theaters. And the personal relationship between Churchill and Smuts was very close. Even though Smuts was Afrikaner, he was an Anglophone Afrikaner. That means he had Anglified and spoke English uh, uh, as, a, uh, as an indigenous or coastal. Now, South Africa developed rhetoric over the period prior to 1990. And I want to just mention some of this debate, some of the images that you'll run into as you do some of your reading. First part of the rhetoric had to do with what was European policy in the 19th and going into the 20th century. What was British policy? There were essentially two things to this debate. They probably weren't all that different because they resulted, of course, in segregation and then apartheid. But the one wing was called trusteeship, and the other wing was called assimilation. Trusteeship took the status of individuals of African origin as being in a paternalistic, paternalistic relationship with the settler community and with British power. It meant that, in a sense, uh, the British justified not giving the right to vote <coughs> to the African because they were trustees of the state. They were protected <coughs> by the state. That was an argument that continued to be used by many, particularly among white South Africans, all the way down to the end of the 1980s. But there was another street which was somewhat uh, easier to understand, but also perhaps just as controversial. It was the idea of assimilation. That is, there were those who argued that there could be equality in South Africa if <coughs> values, language, and culture change. Assimilation suggested that for Africans, Indians, mixed race people to participate, even in a limited way, they would have to become black Europeans, black English, black Afrikaners, and so forth. And so they would have to have some kind of a test in order for them to do so. The idea of a qualified vote, of a qualified set of privileges, not rights, became embedded in the debate on South Africa's future, even down to the end of apartheid in 1990. Uh, and indeed, the negotiations all focused on the question of the vote and whether or not there would be some restrictions on people who didn't pass a certain culture or <coughs> economic or social test. So that, that image is an important part of contemporary South Africa whether you think of it in quote-unquote trustee terms, sort of a paternal, maternal relationship, or whether you think about it as indigenous people from Africa, settlers from India, had to, in fact, give up their own culture. Implicitly, they should give up their own religion and join the mainstream of quote-unquote European values. Important difference, the important debate, but one which has consequences for the 21st century in South Africa. The second part of the rhetoric was whether or not we had segregation or we would later get apartheid. Now, what's the difference between the two? Segregation was somewhat 
similar to segregation in this country. You all shared a common territory, more or less, but of course you had social and economic segregation. You had job preservation, you had the kinds of signs that we saw, which uh, certain people could not go in. Uh, you had, in fact, a uh, legal division of people socially. Apartheid was harder because apartheid wanted to geographically separate people, to create 10 so-called homelands. So that ideally, from the National Party perspective, all Africans, every single African, would become a citizen of one of those 10 quote-unquote homelands, geographic entities that are located within the Republic of South Africa. By the way, that constituted at the most only 13% of the land. The other 87% then would be reserved to South Africa, the now country without Africans. The people who left were left with then share that 87%. So people were restricted after 1948 through to the 1980s legally to political rights in one of those 10 homelands. And if they didn't have a job, if they didn't have permission, legal permission, like immigrants in this country to live in South Africa, then they were considered guest <coughs> workers. And so then they didn't have a job anymore, like we want to send people back to other countries in this country. The African in South Africa would be sent back home to his own country. He would have to leave quote unquote, <coughs> South Africa, white South Africa, the white 87%. So when you read about homelands, remember two things. One, they were geographically defined. They had boundaries. They had their own governments. They represented only less than 14% of the land area of South Africa as a whole. That's the second broad set of debates that were going to occur in the 1980s, how to get rid of these homelands, to what extent they were going to remain as entities. The third issue was the issue of the two so-called two nationalisms. It is very clear that there was a political nationalism among the Dutch, the Afrikaans community. It was clear, it was articulated, it was in many ways very similar to national feelings of other parts of the world. Some critique it as being similar to German nationalism or even Italian nationalism in the 1930s and 1940s. Less clear where the British fit in all of this because the British saw themselves still British, still part of Britain, and in many ways as more visitors in South Africa, some I think still feel the same way. There was also, and is also, a feeling of African nationalism. That is the name of the majority party in South Africa, the African National Congress. Debates here, of course, are, is the African National Congress non-racial, as it currently describes itself? Was it multiracial, as it described itself in the 1960s? Or did it primarily represent what is sometimes referred to as African or black nationalism, that is speaking for the majority population primarily alone. That debate continues to be played out in some of the rhetoric in South Africa today. Finally, there was, and in some ways still is, a debate about majority rule and what that majority might be, and minorities, and the argument about there is not going to be a single majority if one takes culture and language as being the defining factor. And of course, that was the fundamental divide that existed before 1990 when the principle of majority rule was adopted. Majority rule is what rules in South Africa today. They've had four elections now, and I think it's fairly embedded in society. That was not the case before 1990, and was part of the major debate. More than anything else, this man, cover of Time Magazine, 1960 in August, this man represented 
the apartheid South Africa. He was the architect of the homelands policy of what is called grand apartheid of the elaborate <coughs> bureaucratic system that characterized South Africa roughly from 1957 to uh, the end of apartheid in 1990. Now, I'm going to try and see if I can get up the film. What is our future? Now, I want to make quite sure that I will not be misunderstood. I am not using this occasion as a platform for putting forward ideas other than those which I hope will help to bring unity. I see our republic, the republic of the English and the African speaking alike. Tell me what is the heritage of white South Africa? Came together as one by the very past shook them at this time. Through this unity, cooperating in solving the special problems of race relations, so totally different from problems anywhere else in the world. There is the old South Africa, that was Heinrich Berwood, the, the Prime Minister of South Africa, who is best identified <coughs> as uh, uh, the apartheid uh, period. Now, if I can get back to my slides. All right, so here we are now in the 1940s, 1950s, and we're now in the heart of apartheid, a heart of that period when the white 15% dominated South Africa. Two images which, is, which are important. Uh, a tourist pamphlet from the Congo, <coughs> the DRC now probably visit, uh, as I hear. Looks like a happy place to visit, but it's not necessarily. And of course, in South Africa, what we have are white policemen in the truck watching, controlling, and perhaps eventually uh, attacking or arresting the pro protesters marching in the street in a bus boycott. The, the 50s are the, both the, uh, the beginning of this set of images that we've talked about, segregation versus apartheid, trusteeship versus assimilation, the movement towards minority rule on the part of the majority of the population. Most importantly, it reflects a, an image, a vision, a <coughs> history at least in mythological terms of this individual. This is uh, Nelson Mandela as he, as he looked when he was attorney at law, probably about 1956, and of course, wasn't long after that, 1960, 61, that he was arrested several times and then eventually put into Robin Island. He went in, of course, as a young man. He came out as a, uh, as a young, older, much older man, uh, in, 19, in 1990. But in many ways, he personalized and personified the African National Congress, the transformation to the non-racial state. Well, let's put it, let's take a look at the image in 1990. This is what South Africa looked like at that point. Now, Lesotho and Swaziland are external internationally to South Africa. Well, we won't talk about them, but this map portrays the so-called 10 homelands, representing, somebody asked about the languages, roughly the nine languages that uh, exist in South Africa as ethnically linked languages. Clearly, some of them are fairly large, many of them are very small, none of them reflected the realities of where people actually live. <coughs> this is the South Africa that the National Party sought to create when it came to power in 1948. It partly created that image, but uh, ultimately, of course, in 1994, at least legally, all of this stuff left. 
intended. Here is an image of some of the of three of the major uh, Bantu leaders, Bantu stand leaders, as they were called, including uh, Chief Mangopi, Chief Putulezi, and Chief uh, Matanzima. Putulezi, for any of you who are following South Africa at all, became a major, major leader in South Africa, one of the contenders for influence, later ended up as the, uh, as the Minister of uh, uh, the Internal Affairs in South Africa under Nelson Mandela. They were privileged. They represented a small privileged group within the homelands that essentially ran the country. For the rest, however, these two men symbolized the 1970s and 1980s. Oliver Campbell, who went into exile, for 30 years led the ANC in exile, led the various struggles, and of course Mandela, I think that's a reconstruction of his uh, time in, uh, in uh, prison. He was not in prison at that point, but he was showing people uh, the international press where he spent roughly, what, 27 years of his life. We then look forward now to the sort of themes that lead from roughly 1948 through to uh, the present time. <coughs> and I want to just very briefly mention the, these as a preview of where we come. Decolonization is not quite what happened in South Africa, but it approximates it. 1948 leads to the creation of formal legal apartheid. Later, the creation of homelands and nationalism, much of that is justified by rhetoric from the National Party as anti-communism. Anti-communism fit right into the Cold War, and indeed in Southern Africa there were proxy Cold War conflicts in Mozambique, in Angola, in Namibia, and indeed in rhetoric at least in South Africa itself. Anti-communism referred back then to the other two nationalisms we've talked about, uh, leading to, by 1985, South Africa describing itself as, quote, unquote, the polecat of the world. South Africa became politically and internationally economically isolated. It became subject to various forms of sanctions, including international sanctions, and including, in particular, uh, banks beginning to withdraw. You saw what happened when the banks get in trouble in Cyprus or in Greece. Banks withdrawing their money from South Africa was a big deal. Banks, external pressures, the revolution, limited though it was, led by the ANC, and urban discord then all led to what Bishop Desmond Tutu called the Rainbow Nation. Not really a rainbow nation, as we'll talk about in our second session, but certainly a legally defined non-racial state. And of course, it leads, of course, to South Africa because of the size of its economy, the largest economy in Africa, being declared about what, three, four years ago uh, as to be one of the bricks. <coughs> uh, bricks, of course, uh, represent the major economic powers in the world, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and much smaller than all of those, but still important, South Africa. This is the uh, image of apartheid, uh, the National Party, uh, an Afrikaans placard, which I think defines in many ways the whiteness and also the Dutchness of the movement as we talk about. So we'll talk a little bit about the collapse of apartheid, and then we'll take a little bit of a break. Um, there are four things that really lead to the transition. It's hard to figure out exactly which is the most important, and I won't try to suggest it. Clearly, there, the ANC was, a, as I call it, an unnatural rebel. It moved from violence to an aspiration for independence uh, through revolution, but as many South African African national leaders told me when I was doing my <coughs> research there in the 1990s, well, you know, we weren't really very good revolutionaries. That was not our strength. 
The strength, however, came from its international alliances, support from Russia, more correctly the former <coughs> Soviet Union, the mobilizing of Western countries, Scandinavia, Germany, and eventually, uh, by the mid-1980s, the United States, in terms of sanctions, and along with this internationally, ironically, the end of the Cold War, when the South, the, the, the South Africans were told by Gorbachev, we're not going to support your war anymore, get to the negotiating table, get the best bargain you can, they did. But more importantly, two other things were important in the end of the war. <coughs> Urbanization, the fact that the cities in South Africa became ungovernable, significant internal domestic challenges within the townships, and the formation of what was called by 1987 the United Democratic Front, an internal anti-apartheid organization created in 1983, which generated urban discontent, urban protest, but nonviolent, again going back to Gandhi, resistance to apartheid, the UDF, as it was called, in many ways was a strong pressure point. Finally, as is often the case, transition politically occurred because of economic pressures. Sanctions, banks, and other international pressures led to significant economic pressure on South Africa uh, <coughs> over the period of time, uh, roughly from 1980 to 19. The international pressure was a part of it. Now, all of this was led by a coalition of two major groups. The African National Congress, as you can see, Nelson Mandela and his uh, first wife, Winnie, or actually his second wife, Winnie, uh, and the man on the uh, other side of him, Joe <coughs> Slovo, the then leader of the South African Communist Party, close ally from the 1950s, a lawyer. Uh, they went to both for pride together several times. Slovo went with, with uh, uh, Oliver Tambo into exile. And Slovo created the, the quote, the, that is the, the, the military group, uh, the spear of the nation, as it was called, that in fact did fight the struggle. There were some fights, but it was the symbolic threat that the that the, uh, uh, that the sphere of the nation cultural basically threatened in terms of the potential for violence leading to the destruction of the whole country. Rainbow Nation, well, that was an idea that was put uh, forward by Archbishop Desmond Tutu. The idea that in fact there was unity in diversity, some truth to it. We talk about a common South Africa and a common South African identity, but of course it does in fact uh, uh, disguise a, a great deal in terms of what's happened and what's happened in South Africa. All right, let me uh, take us further here into the post-apartheid period. And I want to comment on a number of themes. I think we've already um, noted the, the idea of Rainbow Nation and Invictus and all of the good feelings that we get out of Nelson Mandela are partly to try to create a new story and storyline and are not necessarily reflected in the reality of South Africa, which remains complex uh, and uh, facing significant challenges economically, socially, uh, and uh, in terms of uh, the whole question of uh, security, human security uh, within the country as a whole. A second broad theme is the debate about political institutions that has continued to predominate. The reality, of course, of 21st century South Africa is that it is a majority uh, dominant state. The majority party is the only state which has held power since 1994, uh, it regularly gets between 60 and 70 percent of the vote, and at least until the last election, there isn't significant evidence that there will be a significant opposition challenge. That may happen. I uh, uh, 
the, the constitutional crisis now is with a government which may have lost credibility. This is the government of uh, President Jacob Zuma with significant numbers of voters. How that translates in terms of the future of the dominant African National Congress is, is not clear. A, a fourth issue is the, is the economic reality of black underemployment, black unemployment, and the significant issues that face what is sometimes called black empowerment. Black empowerment is, in effect, a form of affirmative action. It is defined as a way to try to rectify past historical uh, discrimination. Uh, and it's one which uh, continues to be debated, discussed, and sometimes challenged uh, within the legal structures. Uh, we continue to see economically two South Africans, a South Africa of urban uh, underemployment and urban poverty. While there is an increasing middle class within the urban areas, it's still small certainly in comparison to the other minority groups, uh, and still uh, more so in comparison to the majority. There, this is also, in fact, part of what is sometimes called the rural labor reserve system that was set up in South Africa under apartheid. <coughs> Roughly 35 to 40 percent of the population still live in the rural areas. Many are those who are least educated, least employable, and of course, there, in many cases, uh, they remain subsistence agriculturalists, keepers of cattle, or again, uh, underpaid and uh, very lightly supported in terms of agricultural production. And of course, we have in South Africa political crisis, corruption, what I would call a, a, an emerging uh, cultural rejection of, of governance, particularly in terms of increased numbers of satirical responses to government, a, 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 a set of responses that uh, uh, belies the Rainbow Nation myth, increasingly harsh criticism uh, in the newspapers. This has a, a healthy component to a debate democracy, but it also reflects a certain amount of cynicism. No longer the Rainbow Nation is a a very common phrase that you hear with regard to South Africa. So December 26th or the 29th, April 1994 was the election day. No question that that was a major event. Uh, the lines were long, uh, the compromise was many, but the smiles were perhaps not as broad or as uh, unforgiving as is suggested in the, in the images that we get from South Africa. Uh, in 1994. We have a parliamentary system, essentially. Uh, the president is selected by the parliament from the majority party. We do have the institutions of executive government, constitutionally defined. We have an independent judiciary. And legally, we have a majority rule, constitutionally designated parliament or legislative branch. These are important. I don't think they're likely to change. The question is, though, how does this play itself uh, out politically? We have a one-party dominant system. The African National Congress was founded, really, in 1912. Uh, Freedom Charter defined a non-racial state in the 1950s. Freedom Charter remains a, I think, a mythological structure uh, in 2013. We have still many uncertainties about the future of South Africa. Whether or not we're talking about multiracialism, that is different cultures roughly operating on their own but in tolerance with one another. Whether or not we have a non-racial society, or as some will argue, and increasing Africanization of the country with large numbers of people from India, large numbers of people from Europe returning home or, re or moving to other parts of the world. We have a strong 
debate about the role of the urban working class and poor whites, and what is called B, uh, Black Economic Empowerment, which is the African National Party's affirmative action system in the private sector, which critics have said have led to a state-dominated <coughs> consumption and increasingly the word corruption is used to describe the relationship between the private sector bidding for state contracts, soft, understated contracts that are awarded without competition, uh, and increasing levels of both petty, silent, and indeed broad corruption that are evidenced in the newspapers, uh, in the academic studies, and indeed uh, thought about throughout South African society. There is a a, a historical intellectual legacy of African nationalism, of promoting black economic empowerment, coming out of Steve Biko, leader of the, uh, of the black power movement, or of the students' movement, the students' union movement in the 1970s, until he was in fact killed um, by the South African police in custody. In, in custody and his legacy remains an important part of the debate and, in, and the discussion with regard to the future. The stereotype of uh, the lack of a work ethic or debates <coughs> about a work ethic have not disappeared. Much of the stereotypical rhetoric that we saw in the apartheid period <coughs> remains among different groups. Black economic empowerment is described as the tender area, that is the tendered class of people who submit uncompetitive bids for government contracts and are rewarded uh, for their efforts based upon who they know, who they might influence, who they indeed uh, might uh, provide some kind of uh, bribe or other influence through illegal processes. Dependency issues, structural <coughs> issues, remain a part of South Africa in the 21st century. The working class remains far behind. There indeed is significant shortage still of both housing, of electricity, of water, of education, and health. Large numbers of people remain below the poverty line. The gap between rich and poor is widening, though there are members of the African or black middle class who are moving up into the uh, middle class system, uh, it remains a very small amount, probably only about 15 to 20 percent of black South Africans are indeed <coughs> in the middle class, perhaps another 4 to 5 percent uh, in the more elite group, still leaving 20, or sorry, uh, 75 to 80 percent of the population working class or below. Ultimately, the question of the rural-based, peasant-based <coughs> proletariat, the debates about multiracialism, non-racialism, and Africanization remain on the agenda in the uh, 21st century. Two images that we get, the image of the uh, migrant worker coming in from Lesotho or from other parts of the region, Zimbabwe, increasing numbers of political refugees, and still the juxtaposition between the rural-based uh, majority of uh, poor people and the urban lights of Johannesburg and Cape Town and the other city, South Africa cities. South Africa is complex but there remains this labor reserve, which is relatively speaking uh, internationally inexpensive, which of course is how all of the BRICs gain their status through essentially the use of uh, underpaying working class for uh, com competition in the international uh, so-called global, global domain. Race, nationalism, <coughs> ethnicity, is particularly complex for the close to five million people who are quote unquote mixed race or so-called colored. Many of them indeed have already started in significant numbers to vote for the opposition 
And if you look at that picture, you will see these are many of these people are in Cape Town and they're supporting. Well, you don't see much. You don't see a picture of Nelson Mandela there. This was in 1994. You see a picture of F.W. Clerk, this represents the ambiguity of the status of people who have both European and African or other origin in their, in their background. And today, in 2013, the only province in South Africa that is controlled by the minority party, the Democratic Alliance, is the Western Cape. It's a factor in other parts of the world, but the leader of the opposition is the prime minister, or the, uh, the premier of the Western Cape, whose name, uh, Helen Zilla, reflects her Afrikaans background. This is a picture of a family. I don't know the family, but uh, I picked it up. It gives you a sense of the, the heritage of roughly five million people. That is a significant number of people and given that they're concentrated in the Western Cape, some have argued that there really are at least two South Africans, the Western Cape, and everything else. The other part of the increasingly complex issue in South Africa is the conflicting nature of <coughs> labor and of how that's playing itself out in the public sector and in the mining sector, and the fact that increasingly, at least in the last five years, numbers of fairly significant strikes, some recurrence of violence, and of course the continuing, continuing presence of violent crime as part of the reality of life in South Africa. The labor debate probably is the single most important unfinished debate in South Africa today, defining the relationship between those people who try to aspire to a salary and those people who control the economy. There is a middle class. This is a middle class which is important and growing, but it's by and large a middle class which is identified as essentially moving away from the value systems of the majority. Uh, there is an elite in South Africa. It is, uh, there is a black elite, an African elite, it is an elite which has a large amount of wealth from the private sector and a great deal of middle class salary privilege in the public sector, but it, it's a limited group. It's roughly, we're talking about roughly 50% uh, of the population which is underemployed, uh, let alone unemployed. 2008, strikes become very important and violence along with those strikes leading to police confrontations, particularly in the mining sector, but indeed throughout <coughs> South Africa. So we, we have a complex country. You're going to be hearing a lot about it in the next few days, the next couple of days. Um, let me uh, perhaps begin by, <coughs> or, or end up by reflection <coughs> on what I think is the primary ideological debate in South Africa. And it's the debate about whether or not South Africa's private sector is a good thing or a bad thing. That's invented not a resolved question in South Africa. This little cartoon attacking the African National Congress, the dominant party, reflects that. Apartheid is dead. That is no more white uh, Wadas and uh, blacks in chain. Uh, long live privatization of water suggest where many people think the state is gone. Essentially, the privatization of basic goods for the few, uh, indeed, coming out of the so-called Washington Consensus, the idea that the world is globalizing and privatizing. And so South Africa to be a part of the BRICS is part of that international, uh, international dimension. The other thing that's been happening in South Africa, particularly in the last decade because of Zimbabwe, all of the tragedies that have occurred there is what South Africans of uh, many different stripes call xenophobia. That is the idea that we don't like foreigners. And this little cartoon by www.blackcommentator.com suggests that they particularly don't like Zimbabwe uh, uh, nationals. And indeed, a lot of the violence, especially in the northern areas, of South Africa outside in 
Johannesburg has been addressed to uh, at Zimbabwe refugees. I'm going to start stop uh, with a, a little clip again to give you a sense of uh, Julius Malina, a harsh critic of the Zuma government, has become the face of this from crisis, CNN, stepping into the leadership void that's been left by the president and his men, uh, calling for a national strike in all right. of South Africa's minds. Malina was leader of the ANC's youth wing before being expelled for fomenting division within the party. He's now facing corruption charges related to the misuse of party funds while he was in office. And he joins me right now. Julius Malima, you are a very controversial figure and yet you've gone and inserted yourself into a, a, a really violent and, and difficult situation right now. Why have you done that? What do you think you can achieve? No, let's correct one thing here. I'm not facing any uh, corruption charges uh, uh, from any institution. There are, in there's, an investigation any into, there's an investigation into some fraud and allegations of misappropriation. Yes, yes. So, my question yes. is... So, if, if you say I'm facing <laughs> charges, it's as if I'm charged already. No, That's no. not correct. I said you're, there's an investigation and they're looking yes. into it. Could you please tell me what you're yeah. doing inserting your very controversial self into what's going on in South Africa, the mines right now? What do you think you will achieve? The ANC Youth League had uh, its Congress uh, last year in June, here in Johannesburg, and declared economic freedom in our lifetime and called for nationalization of mines and the wealth of the country to be shared amongst all the people living in this country. And therefore, uh, we have now taken over the leadership of that struggle to ensure that uh, the mineral resources of this country benefit the people of this country, particularly the workers who are working very hard in a very risky conditions underground, trying to take out this uh, you know, precious uh, uh, minerals. Mr. Malima, you say you've taken over the leadership of this struggle and this crisis, but you've been expelled from the ANC. I know you're wearing the, uh, the outfit and the logos, but by, by what right do you take over the leadership of this? We remain uh, the leadership of the youth movement of the ANC. The Youth League of the ANC said we remain leaders until 2014 and we continue to play that role uh, to ensure that uh, the working class in South Africa does not become uh, leaderless because uh, those who were charged with such responsibility have taken uh, a leave uh, from discharging such responsibility. Mr. Miller, clearly you are disregarding then your expulsion from the youth wing of the ANC and you're continuing. But my question to you was, uh, what is it that you're saying to them today, to the miners? We have reports that you have told people to strike every five days, rather for five days every month until they get their wage demands. Are you telling people to go back to work and only strike five days a month? What are you saying exactly? No, no. What we are saying is that uh, uh, these strikes that happen in different mines, they need to be coordinated and a national program should be rolled out wherein uh, every month uh, for a week, working days, uh, there will be uh, you know, strikes demanding a better uh, salary for the workers, demanding that uh, the mineral resources of this country be nationalized, and uh, we are going to be announcing, uh, you know, the day of action and subsequent to the day of action will be those five days until the owners of the means of production are ready to sit down with the economic freedom fighters to bargain the way forward. What is it that you want, I mean, I know that the, the 12,500 rand threshold that the miners are demanding. But here's another issue. Some of these miners want to go back to work. Many of them are destitute and they need to put food on the table and look after their families. And some of these striking miners are threatening violence and even threatening to kill those who go back to work. Is that something you condone? We have discouraged uh, uh, violence. 
and uh, we have uh, told uh, the workers that we should believe in the power of uh, persuasion and convince those who are going to work that uh, they too stand to benefit out of this uh, uh, revolution and therefore it is not necessary uh, you know, to sell out uh, and we should continuously do so until we've got 100% uh, support uh, of the workers. And uh, what is the responses uh, of the workers uh, uh, in the mines? And uh, uh, we'll be going into different sectors uh, uh, of our economy and uh, we'll be going to different sectors of our workforce uh, in South Africa. Uh, tomorrow here in South Africa, we'll be speaking to uh, the armed forces, soldiers from the South African National Defense Force, who have also invited us, who have got problems. So we want to consolidate all uh, workers, including the, the unemployed, to come together and to demand what rightfully belongs to them, because we have reached a point where we say enough is enough, we need to share in the country's wealth. Julius Malima, do you believe that stoking racial tensions is a way of getting what you believe the workers are entitled to? Why did you go there and sing that song again today and yesterday that got you into trouble in the first place, Kill the Wars? That is not the song that got me into trouble. But in any event, why did you do it? I don't it? think uh, people know, know, know the difference. No, I didn't sing the song that says Kill the Boer today. So, what did you uh, say? We have you on tape. Because this one in Benek, in, in, in Zulu. You can listen to the tape and get uh, uh, proper interpreters because those who are interpreting for you are actually misleading you and you must fire them. So <laughs> The other one was the, the one that said we are going forward irrespective of us being shot or arrested or being killed. We are soldiering on with the struggle for economic freedom. Let me just play and you this. The Let me just play this. Where in the past. Let me play you the yeah. clip. South Africa still has some uh, political spark in it, and uh, uh, Jacob Zuma, the president of South Africa, has sent us a lot of what I call mixed messages. Uh, Malema, who we've just seen, Julius Malema, is that person who is expected to, uh, by some at least, to lead South Africa over the next decade or so. He's in his 30s. He has a long life ahead of him. We also have the question of the leadership of the Zulu nation, Zulu <coughs> Zalatini, representing the old South Africa. And then we have the Democratic Alliance of South Africa, led by Helen Zilla, who represents uh, what we might call liberal free market thinking, and roughly <coughs> fair to say, the Cape province, the Western Cape province. So I'm going to jump ahead now uh, to our discussion of uh, the questions. I have two prompts, basically. My first prompt is for you to think about, perhaps comment on, the first prompt is, as I said, not everything is what it seems in South Africa. Going back to my image of the snow, which I think is quite important. <coughs> and then the question, this is a Zapiro cartoon that represents uh, one of the leading critics of South African cartoon, political <coughs> cartoons. Uh, the cartoon said, uh, and without uh, any label except that shows Mandela, of course, as a leader, uh, and then the evolutionary, and what I think he would suggest is the devolutionary process, which is a little bit questionable uh, in terms of the imagery 